Good morning, everyone. I'm Jackie Campbell. I am from Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing, and I am the proud co-chair of the Forum on Global Violence Prevention, which is a mechanism of the Institute of Medicine. We are under the Board on Global Health. Uh, there are materials that talk more about the forum mechanism um, that you can get from handouts. Uh, we have here around the table our forum members, um, some of them not quite here yet, um, and people on the planning committee. But you will be introduced to all of them as we go along. I first, uh, before we start, uh, and one of the things one cannot help but be reminded of in terms of violence prevention is the horrific bombing in Boston. And I thought we could just take one minute to um, honor the fallen victims, um, both those who are deceased, but also there's many that are still in critical condition in the hospitals and many have been seriously injured. So if we could just take one moment um, to honor those people. Thank you. Good morning, Patrick. Um, the Forum on Global Violence Prevention is dedicated to preventing those kinds of acts of violence plus other acts of violence. This is our sixth workshop, um, and we are just thrilled that we were able to put on this kind of a workshop on elder abuse, perhaps the most neglected area of violence um, in terms of both science and in terms of collective action. So hopefully this forum can provide a springboard for some of those kinds of actions. Um, in the spirit of, of violence prevention, I would also remind those of us that are US citizens um, that there's very important legislation going on. And if you have not weighed in with your senators, um, in terms of uh, some of the uh, gun violence reduction measures, uh, you might want to take time sometime today because today would be the day. Uh, and now I'm going to turn the um, program over uh, to our uh, workshop leader um, and my good friend, Zeke Don. Thank you, Jackie. It's, it's a truly a pleasure to be here with you today. And, um, and I want to thank the Institute of Medicine and National Academies for supporting this and for our dedicated um, leader, Jackie and Mark, who's not here yet, as well as the planning committee members for their dedication and work and, and the work that Rachel and Megan have put into this. And, and I think we're in interesting times as we reflect back on the events over the last couple of days and over the last number of years and, and as this form have shaped and reshaped over the last six rounds and you know violence is amongst us whether we like it or not um, whether we're thinking about the current debate of S649 the Senate or thinking about the recent events in Boston in Newtown or the violence that happens in our neighborhoods when you hear about the Chicago murder rates, the gunshots and shootings a block away from my house. And during the, one of the meetings in Newtown that parents held as they were in the Senate Hall in Connecticut, the place where I stood advocating for elder abuse issues uh, more than 10 years ago back, one of the reporters after the interview asked one of the mothers. And she said, why are you in there? And the mother's response was, why are you out there? And I think that couldn't be true when we think about violence across lifespan, not just child abuse, domestic violence, elder abuse issues. But 
it surrounds us. And one day when we look in the mirror, it will be, it could be our communities. It could be ones that are affected in our day-to-day -day lives. And yet at the same time, I struggle after watching the couple of weeks ago, the 60 Minutes, where they had parents of the Newtown shooting talk about their lives and how that have impacted them. Amongst everyone that I know, there's not a dry eye in the house listening to those stories. And yet at the same time, I ask myself the question, what is it about the field of elder abuse that doesn't necessarily elicit that type of a raw emotion, that sense of urgency? And yet at the same time, thinking about that, despite many of the social injustices in this world, the ageism still are pervasive in our community, in our workplace, in our day-to-day -day lives. And yet, through the lens of my work, we've seen many forms of elder abuse, whether it's the cases of Brooke Esther in New York, or Mickey Rooney testifying in front of the Senate Committee on Aging, or the cases I've seen in Harbokoa, the Dominican Republic, where the elder abuse takes very different forms of very much of a seasonal patterns. When the crops are being harvested, elderly are often left in front of the hospital. Or through my work in Zimbabwe, looking at cases of elder Benjamin and physical abuse, the political forms of abuse of their lands being taken, them, themselves being physically brutalized. Or the cases in native population, when I worked in Chinle, Arizona, where uh, the matriarchal structure where the elderly man's bag was simply left outside his house and he was expected to leave the family that he had lived with for many years. To my work in the Chinese community, for which many of our qualitative studies indicate the elderly would rather be beating the head with a baseball bat than to have the disrespect and insult and neglect that they'd endure from their family members and the filial expectations that they expect from their day-to-day -day lives. Um, if you can show the next slide. But our work is not easy. You see, the field of elder abuse is often very messy. And today you'll hear many of those components today. And this is a picture of a town called uh, Buford in Wyoming. The population is one. Don Salmon, he's both the janitor and, and the mayor <laughs> in this case. And often in our day-to-day -day work through the many forms of violence, that's what we feel like that we're diving very deep into a specific issue, and often we feel that we are along in our pursuit of truth, in our pursuit of knowledge and advocacy and pushing for these issues. And yet at the same time, that collaboration often is very difficult in this case. And this is a picture from a town called Skagen, Denmark. This is where the Baltics and the North Sea meets. The density of the two oceans are so different you can vif physically, visually see a line between them itself. And as with many cases of collaboration, because we often speak very different vocabularies, we speak very different words, and our interest in our day-to-day -day work often may not lend us into a natural lens of collaboration, which are so important in this type of work, and not just the elder abuse, but all form of violence and aging-related issues. And yet at the same time, that the perceived differences amongst us are very small. And this is a cafe in the boundary between Belgium and Netherlands itself. And, and when we look very closely into what are our differences and where we can succeed and collaborate, there are many opportunities. And I hope today is one of those opportunities that we can embrace and be open-minded about despite the differences, the skepticism that we have about whether it's each other's work or the field's progression, or how does that fit into the broader conversation of social justice and human rights issues and, and, and ageism and successful aging. And yet at the same time, we often need to take a leap of faith. So when Felix Baumgartner stood 24 miles above the sky and looking down and wondering whether he's gonna make it, whether he'll be alive at the end of this, that took enormous preparation, but also incredible leap of faith to, willing to willingness to be able to think about his pursuit of his dreams as we pursue our interests and what we hope to discuss over the next couple of days. And yet at the same time, many of the things we believe often 
you know, have changed over the years. And this is a very famous British mathematician, physicist, and he was a former president of British Royal Society. He was known as the Lord Kelvin, or known as the Kelvin factor. He was the um, um, authority in the deciding absolute zero in this case. And those were his words. And, and he's certainly not the only one. And when you have looked at even Albert Einstein back in 1932, those are his words about the way atomic energies can be shaped. And you'll, hear the, you'll see those snippets today throughout the conversation. And I think it's important to think about, despite the barriers for the field, that we can still have tremendous potential if we open our mind to collaboration, to listening to each other, and to challenge each other as well. And I think our task is great. Our burden is also great in this case. And over the next two days, we want to bring the global perspective on the field of elder abuse because it, it, it surrounds us more than what we think it is. And it impacts us in many different ways. And yet the complexities of elder abuse, it's not just through the lens of epidemiology, the scope of the issues, but also how does the neglect issue come in, differentiate between caregiver neglect and self-neglect, the ethical dilemmas that are often embark on us that makes it difficult to even think about those issues, think about the rights to self-determination and beneficence issues, the policy issues, the culture issues that we need to deep dive very deeply into. Without them, often it feels like we are looking at different parts of the elephant. And yet we need much more of a global comprehensive picture today. So I hope over the next two days that we will challenge each other, that you will challenge us, and for the audiences on the, on the webcast, to send me your comments, and, and for the Twitter folks, the Twitter Prevent Elder Abuse, to send us your thoughts throughout the next couple of days as well. And we hope it will be a fruitful discussion, and we're absolutely uh, uh, pleased that you're with us um, for this event. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker, Dr. Judy Salerno. Dr. Salerno is a it's the, it's the Leonard Schaefer Executive Office for Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. She serves as the Executive Director of Chief Operating Officer. In the capacity, she manages IOM's research and policy programs and guides the institutes of operation on a daily basis. Prior to coming to the IOM, Dr. Cerno was the, was the Deputy Director of uh, NIA and is a uh, NIA senior geriatrician. She's vitally interested in improving health and well-being of older adults, design public and private initiatives to address aging stereotypes, novel approaches to support training of new investigators in aging and award-winning programs and communicate health and research advances to the public. On a personal note, you know, uh, Dr. Cerno has been instrumental part of the health and aging policy program over the years, and I've had the privilege of, of her wisdom over the years as well. Um, and it's absolutely delight that she's with us today. Thank you. <laughs> 